Our text this morning is Judges chapter 12. Then the men of Ephraim gathered together, crossed over towards Zephon, and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over to fight against the people of Ammon, and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house down on you with fire. And Jephthah said to them, My people and I were in a great struggle with the people of Ammon, and when I called you, you did not deliver me out of their hands. So when I saw that you would not deliver me, I took my life in my hands, and I crossed over against the people of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them in my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? Now Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought against Ephraim. And the men of Gilead defeated Ephraim because they said, You Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim, among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. The Gileadites seized the fords of the Jordan before the Ephraimites arrived. And when any Ephraimite who escaped said, Let me cross over, the men of Gilead would say to him, Are you an Ephraimite? If he said no, then they would say to him, Then say Shibboleth. And he would say, Sibboleth, for he could not pronounce it right. Then they would take him and kill him at the fords of the Jordan. There fell at that time 42,000 Ephraimites. And Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried among the cities of Gilead. After him, Ibzon of Bethlehem judged Israel. And he had 30 sons and he gave away 30 daughters in marriage and brought in 30 daughters from elsewhere for his, son, for, uh, for his sons. He judged Israel seven years. Then Ibzon died and was buried at Bethlehem. After him, Elon the Zebulonite judged Israel. He judged Israel ten years. And Elon the Zebulonite died and was buried at Ijalon in the country of Zebulun. After him, Abda the son of Hillel the Perothonite judged Israel. He had forty sons and thirty grandsons who rode on seventy young donkeys. He judged Israel eight years. Then Abda the son of Hillel the Perothonite died and was buried in the Perothon in the land of Ephraim in the mountains of the Amalekites. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, we ask you for your blessing on us. We lift our eyes to you and ask that you would give us the eagle-eyed eyesight of faith that we might see and know you. Bless us as we come to your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 This week is the end of the section in Judges on Jephthah. So it's been a couple of weeks now we've been working through this. So we, um, we just have this short little section regarding Ephraim being fussy uh, at the beginning of the first half of chapter 12. And then that's followed by three more minor judges. Um, to be honest, I just don't have too much to say about the minor judges other than uh, they were all getting really into 30s, 70s, and donkeys. That's the extent of my observations with them, I'm afraid. Um, which seems like, I, I think the 30s, the 70s, and the donkeys all seem to indicate that they were really trying to be somebody. They, they were, they, they were um, feeling fairly self-important, but um, it doesn't seem like it happened. they left enough along the Book of Judges to give us much more about them. Uh, so my focus this morning will be just on this first half of Judges chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. Um, now, um, two weeks ago, which was I think the last time I preached at the beginning of the sermon, I had to um, confess to you that my, my bag uh, uh, was way overweight. Um, this week, I can tell you, I promise you, I just have carry-on. It's, it's, a, it's a light week. We're going we're gonna to breeze through. Don't worry about the fact that we got a, a him less than a month. We're, we're fine. Um, now, uh, remember that God raised Jephthah up uh, in the midst of the Gileadites in order to deliver Israel from the invading Ammonites, the pagan Ammonites who are invading from uh, the east. And in the tribe, I mean, in, the, in the chapter 12 here, where we are today, the tribe of Ephraim has gotten offended that they were not invited to the battle. So, so um, Jephthah just came out, he was raised up to deliver Gilead from the Ammonites. It's already happened, he's defeated the Ammonites. Should be end of story, everything should be just fine. But Ephraim, his own fellow brother tribe, is now upset at him, so upset that Ephraim is going to take up arms against Jephthah. So verse 1, the men of Ephraim gathered together, we're told, cross over towards the phone, and they come to challenge him and to fight him. The men of Ephraim gathered together. I think it's interesting that there's no uh, single leader in Ephraim. 
you get this sense that it was just this kind of organic and natural outrage that the whole tribe instantaneously felt together. You know, Gilead has gone to battle without us, and the entire tribe is incensed, and, and, and without any coordination, they just gather together, and, they, and they, they come after Gilead in one big tribal tantrum. Uh, they gather as an army, and it says that they cross over. So if you remember a little back, a couple chapters back, I spent a little bit of time giving you a bit of a geography lesson. They even uh, left out some maps. You might have one or two of those around somewhere still. But Ephraim, the tribe of Ephraim, was that very centrally located tribe. And then on the, the east side of Ephraim, you would have the Jordan River. And then if you cross the river, you go out into the kind of rockier land, and that's where Gilead is. It's the Transjordan going on the east side of the Jordan River. And so we're going to notice a couple of times in this chapter that somebody crosses over the Jordan, and that's a significant thing. Um, Ephraim crossing over the Jordan is them now taking an army and invading into Gilead's territory. Uh, but in order to invade a territory, they have to cross over the Jordan. Now in verses 2 and 3, Jephthah, um, just in the same way he did when he challenged the Ammonites, remember when he goes out to the Ammonites, he starts actually, first of all, trying to talk them out of it. He gives them his arguments for why they ought not to have to fight. doesn't work, so he destroys them in battle. And he gives, he gives Gil, or, um, Ephraim the same chance here. Verses 2 and 3, Jephthah tries to give his argument for why they ought not to have to go to battle. He says, listen, I, I invited you, you didn't come, I needed to defend myself, there's no reason for you to take offense at this. But again, it doesn't work, and so um, Jephthah, in verse 4, has to gather his army together, and, and he gathers his army together, and he goes to meet the invading Ephraimites as they're coming across the Jordan. Um, in verse 4, I think it's worth noting the, the trash-talking of Ephraim. Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought against Ephraim. And the men of Gilead defeated Ephraim because they had said, you Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim, among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. You Gileadites, you are, you are fugitives. You are, um, the, the word there translated fugitive could be uh, like escapee. You are, you are the castoffs, the, uh, the fugitives, the, the rejects. Of Ephraim, um, and that's how that's how Ephraim taunts Gilead. You are the fugitives, the castoffs, the escapees. Um, but we find that uh, the men of Gilead defeat Ephraim um, pretty handily. He Jephthah strikes the Ephraimites, and the Ephraimites flee from the field of battle, and they try to make home. They try to escape. And now that that Jordan River that they have crossed, sort of in this triumphant and brave way and coming to battle. Now they're fighting to just try to get to the fords of the Jordan and get across so they can get home um, safely. So they're trying to get across uh, the river. In verse 5, the Gileadites seized the fords of the Jordan before the Ephraimites arrived. And when any Ephraimite arrived, so they've gotten cut off, they can't get back home, those that have escaped the battle. Okay, they, those that escaped the battle are trying to get across the ford, and they would come and they would say, Are you an Ephraimite? They'd say, No, not me. Um, and then they would say, say the word Shibboleth. And it's here we discover that, that the tribe of Ephraim had its own special, unique little accent where they can't say the SH, they have to say it with an S. So they instead of saying Shibboleth, they say Sibboleth. Um, the, the word Shibboleth, it just it's a kind of a rare word, it just means either. Flowing stream or ear of corn. I don't know how you have one word that means both those things, but apparently it means either of those. Not a very common word, but I think the only reason it's used here is because it puts shibboleth, puts the sh right in the front, and it and it exposes um, the Ephraimites and their accent. So if they if they get it wrong, they are cut down at that moment. What I think is really poetic is to look at who it is that the Gileadites are catching. Um, uh, um, who it is that the Gileadites are catching at. When, when any, uh, any Ephraimites who escaped said, let me cross over, okay, that word escape. So you've got the Ephraimites, they've escaped from the battle, and that's who the, the Gileadites are catching. They've escaped from the battle. What's, what's funny is that word escape, go back to verse 4, that's the word that Ephraim was taunting Gilead with. You were a bunch of fugitives. That same word could mean escaped, cast off. Um, that word is now describing the, the Ephraimites. They are the ones that are the fugitives that have escaped. And over the course of one verse, this taunt that Ephraim had at Gilead 
is back on them. They're the ones that are running the battle and barely giving away. So who is the fugitive now? In just one verse, this taunt is turned back against them. Now, back in chapter 10, I spent some time trying to introduce the tribe of Ephraim to you. And I said that Ephraim was this really central and important tribe, but this importance was starting to go to their head. And they, they, were, they were this really significant tribe, but the significance was starting to give them an inflated view of themselves. Um, when I say that they're an important tribe, the way I illustrated, it, illustrated that was pointing out how many of the early judges all came from Ephraim. Um, the tabernacle was in Shiloh, which is in Ephraim. Uh, Joshua came from Ephraim. So you have lots of really important people. There's a, there's a higher concentration or a disproportionate concentration of the significant characters and leaders of Israel are all coming from Ephraim. And the tabernacle is Ephraim. It's like the central, most important tribe. The Ephraimites were the tribe of greatest prominence, but this prominence, as I was saying before, had resulted in a sinful attitude of self-importance. They begin to think too much of themselves. For instance, um, we're, in the, we're in the very end of the story of Jephthah right now, but if we were to go back, the previous story was Gideon and Abimelech, his son of Abimelech. We had a couple of chapters just telling the story of Gideon and Abimelech. Remember, God raised up Gideon in order to deliver Israel from the Midianites. And, and at the end of Gideon managing to conquer the Midianites and drive them out, Listen to what happens. This is Judges chapter 8, verse 1. Okay, he's just driven out the Midianites. 8, verse 1. Now the men of Ephraim said to him, said to Gideon. So the tribe of, of Ephraim shows up just after Gideon has driven out the Midianites. And the tribe of Ephraim says to Gideon, Why have you done this to us by not calling us when you went to fight with the Midianites? And they reprimanded him sharply. And if you remember, uh, uh, Gideon has to really delicately dance his way out of that situation where he has to tell him, oh, but Ephraim, you're so important, I have nothing compared to you. And it's just, he has to like, play to their, their self-importance, and he gets himself out of it at this time. But then we've got the exact same thing here in chapter 12. Again, um, a judge has fought off from enemies, but Ephraim didn't get invited, and Ephraim is insulted. You don't go to battle without calling us, right? There's no other tribe in Israel that does this. It's only Ephraim that thinks that they're so important that anything, anytime anything important happens, Ephraim is supposed to be there with them. With Jephthah, they are angry once again that they were not invited to battle. Only this time, they're so angry that they're ready to go to war against their own brother tribe because they think it is so insulting that they would do this. That you would have a moment of glory and greatness over there, and Ephraim hasn't been invited. We need to go and kill you. All right? We're going to burn your house down um, on top of you. Yeah. They're very upset about this, this um, being wrong like this. Um, they, they clearly have gotten this very inflated sense of self. And I, I think it's also interesting that the fact that they've developed their own little affectation of a dialect. Um, they're, they're the only tribe that has this little accent, right? You know they're from Ephraim if they if they say Shiloh wrong. Um, the they they have this own affectation of a dialect that sets them apart. I think of the the, the Shibboleth, um, Sibboleth, I, to be not able to say Shibboleth but only say Sibboleth. It reminds you of if you've done Spanish, you know you have like the Barcelona accent where you, you don't say Barcelona, you say Barcelona. And it's this application that sounds really weird, but I think that if you're in the Spanish mindset, it sounds kind of sophisticated and, and, and a little bit um, urbane and, and suave to say Barcelona. Um, it, it sounds weird if you're not from there, and I think Shibboleth is a little bit like that. And it's a real sort of city boy sophistication that there, there's an air that is being put on, and it's an air for Ephraim, and Ephraim only. There's a real self-importance that has um, that has settled into the heart and soul of the men of the tribe of Ephraim. But I, I want to I want to dive into that a little bit more because the prominence of Ephraim that had gone to their head, I up till now I've described it as well, they just had a lot of really important men who came from Ephraim. And so they started to think of themselves as very important. But that's not exactly true. There's actually quite a lot more behind Ephraim's inflated sense of self-worth. There's a deep significance to Ephraim 
that goes all the way back to the patriarchs. It goes all the way back, and it's worth us taking a little bit of time to go back and do some of the um, look, look through some of the footnotes to understand why it is that Ephraim thinks of himself this this way. Um, to explain this, I want to go back to a passage of scripture that's known as Jacob's blessing. This is in Genesis uh, 49. It's the it's the penultimate chapter of the book of Genesis. So think of the book of Genesis as introducing us to the patriarchs. We're right at the very end of the story of the patriarchs, right at the end of the book of Genesis. And it's right at the end of Jacob's life. Okay, we've gone through all the patriarchs, and we're at Jacob's life, and, and he's he's on his deathbed yeah. down in Egypt. And he, he's he's dying, and before he dies, he gives a blessing to each of his sons, to his 12 sons who have joined him. Um, down in Egypt. That's the, the blessing of Jacob, and it's how the book of Genesis is going to wrap things up. He's lying on his deathbed, he gives blessings to each of his sons. Look at verse 1 of chapter 49. And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. <coughs> it's, it's, um, so Jacob is giving each of his sons a blessing, but notice that he says here, his blessing for each son is actually a prophecy. Um, I'm going to tell you what will befall you in the last days. He's, he's giving blessings that are prophetic, prophetic descriptions of future events. Here's how things will play out. First of all, Reuben, verses 3 and 4. Reuben, Reuben is his oldest. Reuben is his firstborn, who would normally receive uh, the birthright, the double portion inheritance, the most prominent position. But Reuben, Jacob says, Reuben, you went and you slept with Bilhah, one of Jacob's concubines. You went into your father's concubines. And he says, because of that, you are out. You don't, you're that position of prominence, you don't have to force it when you defiled your father's head like that. Look at verses 5 through 7. Simeon and Levi, the next two in order, number two and number three, they would be next. Um, but he says, you use circumcision, the sign of the covenant, to go and murder our neighbors in the incident with Dina. That's from Genesis 34. And so he says, you are out. Okay? Um, Reuben, you're out. Simeon, out. Levi, disqualified. All of you are out. This takes us now to son number four. The fourth son would be Judah. And Judah gets, in verses 8 through 12, um, a much larger section and a much stronger blessing that is reserved just for him. Verses 8 through 12 all describe the blessing that is that is piled up and heaped onto Judah, that, that fourth position. Um, look at verse 10. I'll just read this. This is probably the most important part of the blessing that is given to Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Okay, The scepter will not depart from Judah. This is the promise of the coming Messiah. Uh, King David, who will be the, the descendant of Judah, the seed of Judah, that is this fulfillment of this promise. And then David himself passes that blessing on until it finally culminates in Jesus Christ, the true Messiah, um, the, one, the one true king. And so Judah, obviously a pretty prominent blessing, and it makes sense because in birth order, Judah is fourth, right after Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, who had all been disqualified. So it makes sense that Judah is up next. But here's the interesting thing. Even though Judah was given this great promise, uh, this blessing of the promised scepter, he was not promised the birthright of the firstborn. You might think that because the other three were disqualified, and now Judah gets something big, that this is the, um, the, the, the double portion birth blessing of the birth firstborn. He was promised that the scepter would rise up in his line, but he was not promised the birthright of the firstborn. That was reserved for somebody else. It was reserved for Joseph. Um, Jacob saved that blessing for Joseph. If you go down a little bit further in Jacob's blessing in Genesis 49, look at verses 22 through 26. 22 through 26, we get another really long blessing. Judah and Joseph get the two big ones. Everybody else gets either what feels a little more like a curse, or they get very short little blessings. But Judah and Joseph get the big ones. And Joseph's blessing is verses 22 through 26. Look at verse 23. He's describing this blessing that has been reserved for him. He says, The archers bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. 
You have to remember the setting here. Jacob um, has come down to Egypt because the son that he thought was dead and gone has suddenly been discovered. And he's brought down to Egypt and discovers that, that his sons, all of his sons together, had, had sold their brother Joseph into slavery. And he's been sojourning in Egypt all this time. And now, as he comes down there, his son Joseph is the one who has stored up all this wealth and is delivering his entire family, um, even though his family had rejected him like this. And so he says, Joseph, you've, you've had this life where it was like archers firing at you from all sides, people hating you, people attacking you, from your brothers down to Potiphar's wife, down to you throw, being thrown into prison and, and then finally being lifted up by Pharaoh. It's been a whole life of archers shooting at him, hating him. But Joseph has persevered. He's made, remained strong. Um, in, in verse 26, the blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. I've, been, I've received more than all my ancestors, all my siblings have received so much. And he says, um, they, these blessings, shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who is separate from his brothers. All my blessings I'm piling on you, you who were exiled by your brothers, cast out by your brothers, in fact, I think you could say maybe because you've been ex exiled by your brother, separated from your brothers, because you endured all that, I, I save all this up. I give the double portion. I give the first right to you, uh, the firstborn to you. This blessing given to Joseph was the double portion, exceeding what was given to the other brothers. Um, now, Moses, at the end of his life, like um, like Jacob, um, also gives a final blessing to the 12 sons of Jacob. So at the end of Genesis, we have the, um, it ends with Jacob giving his blessing on his 12 sons. At the end of Deuteronomy, which is the end of the Pentateuch, or the end of the Torah, okay, the first five books of the, Bible, of the Old Testament, at the end of that, that one ends with Moses giving his blessing on the 12 sons of Jacob, who are now the 12 tribes. So in Jacob, in Genesis, it's Jacob blessing the 12 sons. In Deuteronomy, it's Moses blessing the 12 tribes. And he does the same thing. So if you flip to Deuteronomy 33, again, I believe the penultimate chapter of that book. What you see is that he saves his largest, longest, most intense blessing again for Joseph. It, it's verses 13 through 17 in Deuteronomy 33. Okay, that's all one long blessing for Joseph. Um, and let me just read from half of 16 on. Um, let the blessing come on the head of Joseph, just as Jacob said. I'm going to put all this blessing on the head of Joseph. And on the crown of the head of him who is separate from his brothers, the one who is exiled by his brothers, all of this blessing will be on his head. And his glory is like a firstborn bull. He'll be like that firstborn. And his horns like the horns of the wild ox. Together with them, we shall push the peoples to the ends of the earth. They are the ten thousands of Ephraim, they are the thousands of Manasseh. Joseph has two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And I think what's happening is Jacob basically is saying, you get the double portion because your two sons each become a tribe themselves. Ephraim and Manasseh each get to become a tribe because J Joseph has uh, a double portion. Um, and so... All this blessing again going on to Ephraim and Manasseh. And again, notice that it's because you were rejected and cast out by your brothers. The one who was separate from his brothers is now the one to carry the greatest glory in Israel. Because Joseph had been persecuted, cast out by his brothers, Jacob gave to Joseph the double portion of inheritance of the firstborn. Now, just to be clear, let me, let me give you one more text. First Chronicles chapter 5. I just want to make sure you, you see it's clear. I'm not just reading something in because this is pretty explicit about what is exactly just happened. First Chronicles chapter 5, starting verse 1. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, remember Reuben is Jacob's oldest, and he's the one that um, went into his father's concubine and therefore was disqualified. Okay. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, he was indeed the, the firstborn, but because he defiled his first his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. So the genealogy is not listed according to the birthright. Yet Judah prevailed over his brothers, and from him came a ruler, although the birthright was Joseph's. 
Joseph got the birthright, and he was put in the place of where Reuben had been. Judah got the promise of a scepter, but that was a different thing. Joseph was given the birthright and a double portion. Now, I've been describing the prominence given to Joseph, but as I said, Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, whom Jacob promoted to be tribes themselves. That was Joseph's double portion. But if you remember that story, um, jumping back to Genesis 48, I'm going back actually just one chapter because I was in Genesis 49 and 4, now I'm going to be in Genesis 48. If you remember the story when, when um, Jacob gives the blessing to Ephraim and Manasseh, remember that Joseph sets them up so that um, Manasseh is the older and Ephraim is the younger. So he sets them up so that Manasseh, um, Jacob's right hand will be on Manasseh and his left hand will be on Ephraim because Ephraim is the younger. So Manasseh is supposed to be, get the greater, stronger blessing, which is what the right hand is supposed to signify. But we're told that when that happened, um, when, when, uh, when Joseph sets the two sons up, Jacob crosses his hands. Um, but his father, uh, in verse 18, Joseph said to his father, not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also should become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you, Israel will bless, saying, May God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And thus he set Ephraim before Manasseh. Despite Joseph's protestations, Jacob placed Ephraim over his older brother Manasseh. So when Joseph, who had been rejected by his brothers, had been separate from his brothers, was given the largest inheritance, the double portion of the, uh, the um, first, the double portion birthright of the firstborn. When all, all of that is given to Joseph. And then Ephraim, Joseph's youngest son, was given the prominent uh, primary portion of this inheritance. So all of that is to say that it is not just that Ephraim happened to have a disproportionate number of important people that came from their tribe. Ephraim had been blessed as the primary piece of Israel's inheritance. Ephraim had been given this prominence by, by God himself. And, and we've done it through the blessing of uh, Jacob. So it's unsurprising then to see things like a disproportionate number of prominent people all coming from Ephraim, or the tabernacle being placed in Shiloh, which is in Ephraim. Earlier I was describing it like, well, maybe Ephraim is prominent because these things happen to have happened there. But I think it's more likely to say these things happen to have happened there because Ephraim is prominent. God set them aside, and, and then God caused all sorts of things to happen to Ephraim because it was his most important tribe. It was, it was the firstborn. It was the birthright. But now, we, we, we encounter Ephraim in the book of Judges at chapter 12. We encounter Ephraim here when that inheritance, this incredible blessing that they received from God, has clearly gone to their heads, right? It, it's, it's, it's puffed them up and gotten them into a sinful place. They, they rebuke Gideon for going to battle without calling them. Who are you to go to battle without inviting me? Ephraim, most important tribe. They actually go to war against Gilead for going to war without them in Judges 12. No other tribe is claiming this right. This, this self-importance here is a bit shocking. The accent they have for themselves, setting themselves apart. But it's more than shocking. It's also deeply ironic. You might remember that when I was describing the story of Jephthah, we go back to the original story of Jephthah and kind of where he comes from. Um, remember, he's the one who, he's the son of a, of a prostitute, and his older brothers, or no, I'm sorry, probably younger brothers, his brothers then, um, when, when, when they start to grow older, his brothers cast him out because they don't want the son of this other prostitute woman being around him. He's driven out of his own home, out of his own city. And um, and when we were going through all that, at the time, I said that it's ironic or it's interesting how the story of Jephthah is basically the story of Joseph all over again. Jephthah and Joseph really parallel each other um, quite closely. Remember that, that so Jephthah is cast out by his brothers because he was the son of a harlot. So his brothers drive him out to keep him from inheriting with them. He's cast out by his own brothers just as Joseph was cast out by his own brothers, sold into slavery, driven 
out of the home. They don't want him around. They don't want um, him around in and, case and he might become favored in some way. They, they, they drive him out. Then, then Jephthah, though he was cast out, remember how it bec- he suddenly becomes the only one who can save and deliver his brothers. He is the mighty man. And when the Ammonites invade and they need somebody to save them, they all immediately think, Jephthah. We need Jephthah. Jephthah. We have to bring him back. And, um, and so Jephthah is brought back in order to deliver his brothers. Just as Joseph, who is driven out, and then turns out to be the one he was driven out so that he could save his family, so that he could store up all the stores that were ready for the, the famine, and so he could deliver his family. He's driven out, and then he becomes the only one that can deliver his family. And just as Jephthah becomes the leader of the brothers, they have to bow down to him and serve him. So also Joseph's brothers have to come back and bow down to him and serve him. It's a really interesting kind of parallel. So Joseph was given this special right of being the firstborn because of how he had faithfully borne the rejection and being cast out by his brothers. He had had walked through all of that so faithfully. The archers shot at him, he just persevered and was faithful. And now the sons of Joseph, namely the tribe of Ephraim, clothed in all the double portions and birthright that their father's faithfulness had won for them. Now those people, that crowd, prominent position because of Joseph's faithfulness, now they encounter Jephthah, a man so similar to Joseph. The, The same story and everything. And they look at him and they mock him for it. You and all Gilead are a bunch of outcasts, people that we toss out. You are the rejects, okay? Don't don't come talk with us because you are the rejects. But Joseph, your father, was once a tossed out as an outcast. That's where you come from. That's why you're in this position of prominence now. And so God has to humble Ephraim. And in this battle here in in Judges 12, we're told that 42,000 Ephraimites are cut down in verse 6. 42,000 of them are cut down between the battle and then trying to get across the fords again. They lose 42,000 men. If you go back to Numbers 26, verse 37, it gives the count of Ephraimites when they entered the Promised Land. Not when they exited Egypt, but when they, after sojourning in the wilderness and they come into the Promised Land, um, they had 32,000 men. So they had 32,000 men, and now at this point, 42,000 men are slaughtered. Now, I assume those 32,000 men that we, we, we had a lot more after that, but that's all to say that 42,000 must have still been a pretty significant uh, percentage of the population of Ephraim. Must have been a pretty devastating setback. Despite their prominence, Israel's loftiest tribe is brought tremendously low at this point, trying to sneak across the Jordan River one by one, trying to get home and getting caught and exposed by their affected accent and slaughtered by Jephthah, the outcast son of a prostitute. It's a pretty humbling moment, I think, for Ephraim. The thing I want to point out here in, uh, with, this, in, with this bit of scripture is how it's remarkably easy to move from being the victim to being the perpetrator. You notice that? It's so easy to move from being the victim to being the perpetrator. Joseph was clearly the victim of his brothers. They had mistreated him. He was the victim. Um, but by the time of Jephthah, Ephraim, Joseph's descendants, had become an entitled perpetrator, victimizing all that surround him. And it's so strange, because Joseph's faithfulness in being that victim is what put Ephraim into this position of great prominence. But it goes to their head, and they use that to then now victimize everyone that surrounds them. You see, once you get stuck in a certain narrative about yourself, um, once you start to always see yourself in one particular way, you tell yourself, I'm the sad one. I'm the one that that, that people are unfair to. I'm the one that sad things happen to. Once you you, um, uh, set yourself in a narrative like that, it becomes easy to quickly dismiss all the facts that contradict this vision of yourself. It becomes easy to never see your own faults or your own flaws because you're so consumed by the narrative that you're in. If you identify yourself as fundamentally the victim, and therefore fundamentally innocent, then you really struggle to see your own complicity in your own subsequent sins. And it becomes possible to do great evil to others, while still seeing yourself as the real innocent victim in all of this. 
It's the, it's the danger of living inside a false narrative about yourself rather than living inside the plain facts about yourself. You tell this story about yourself, and that story comes to dominate, and then you just dismiss anything that doesn't fit inside of that narrative. And that narrative, again, is that narrative of victimhood. We need to be really careful about that because we live in a, in a world that just constantly is coaching you on how to see yourself as a victim. The narrative of victimhood is powerful because it makes you feel fundamentally righteous. It's so strange how feeling sad about yourself, feeling, um, feeling about, you know, having lots of stories about how other people do you wrong. It's strange because you're describing this, this world in which you're always on the receiving end, uh, end of pain and, 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 and terrible deeds. And yet, it can make you feel so pleasantly righteous. It, 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 there's something that will just, there's something sweet about that kind of story that you will cling to it and you will inflate it all, every chance you get to make yourself feel more and more righteous. We live in a world that encourages us all to look for areas in which we can claim victimhood and to identify ourselves in terms of that. We're subtly taught to see the world as a place of systematic uh, discrimination, right? The, we, we are taught to see the world as a place of, of systematic discrimination everywhere. And you can construct your narrative by picking the countless ways that you might be discriminated against. You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to go out and you're supposed to identify the different relationships and, and power structures where you are somehow the one being taken advantage of. You're supposed to identify that and you're supposed to add them all up. You, we're told, live at the intersection of a myriad of ways of being oppressed. Okay, Lots of different lines that cross and you're at the center of it all. Um, and, and each of those is another way that you are being oppressed and held down and you are the victim. The, and the more lines of discrimination that intersect at you, the stronger your claim of victimhood is. That intersecting is important. You've probably heard of um, um, that, that, that word, intersectionalism. This idea that, that there are all kinds of different um, structures out there that oppress you, and you live at the intersection of many of them. <clears throat> how many of those you can add up tells us how victimized you are. Okay? Or, contrary-wise, contrary -wise, when you look at other people, the more lines of oppression that intersect at who they are, the more we can despise them as oppressors, right? The more, the more places where I can see, oh, he has this advantage, he has this advantage, he has this privilege, this advantage, then he lives at this intersection of, of advantage and privilege, and therefore he is the oppressor. And, and he may have done nothing to you, but you can just despise him and loathe him because he's the most evil person ever. What has he done? It doesn't matter what he's done. Look at the kind of person he is, the kind of privilege that surrounds him. This is the intersectionality that you see in like the DEI moves that are all around us. Um, but what I, I would also point out, though, that... Um, well, let me I'm going to go to that qualification in a second. What we see is victimhood being turned once again to become the perpetrator. Okay, the victimhood becomes the perpetrator. It's happening in the world of DEI all around us, where unfair employment practices or unfair college enrollment practices are justified because supposedly the only way that you can undo oppression is by oppressing the previously privileged. So we have to do we have to do bad things to these people that are privileged in order to just kind of even things out. Now, but the thing I would like to point out, though, is the way that we can see this in the world around us, and it can get really frustrating when you see unfair employment or unfair admissions or something like that. But, you know, it doesn't take long before those things start to add up, and you've just created a new way for yourself to feel victim, victimized, right? Um, I am, because I am the white, straight, Christian, evangelical, you know, uh, American, then... I can see all the different ways in which I am now being victimized, I am being discriminated against because, and, and you just use that same story to flip around and be upset about all the different ways that you're being mistreated. It, it never takes us long at all to find some way in which we are the victims because this is something that is so natural to our hearts. You know, think about just how you relate inside of your family. And as a husband, all right, how often do you come home and find yourself adding up all the little things in the home that are somehow not treating you um, fairly, 
as you feel like you are, are you know, you have earned, what, what is, what is uh, deserved by you? Or, or, or ladies, how easy is it if you spend the day cleaning, cooking, preparing everything, only for the, you know, the locust to descend, trash it all without a single thank you, and then move on. And it's pretty easy to sit there and go, I am, I am used, I am abused, I am the victim. Kids, you do the same thing quite easily. Uh, it's easy to look around at schools, friendships, uh, the way your parents treat you, the chores they give you. We want to always see everything as this unfair, unfair expectation on us. We like to see ourselves as victims. This pattern is as old as the hills. And we, we can see it when it's in the DPI world. We can see it for what it is. We can see through it. We can say, that's terrible. Don't be a victim. We, we can see it when it's over there. But how easy is it for us to miss when it's in our own lives, with our own facts, or with our own narratives? Now, there is such a thing as being a victim. I want to be careful about that. There is such a thing as being a victim. There is such a thing as being oppressed. But what we need to be careful about is to not think for a moment that victims are necessarily totally innocent. Victims are not innocent. They are not pure. Okay? Here's what I mean. Let me, let me walk through this. I think I mentioned um, a while ago, maybe it was last summer, um, my, my car got told. Um, it was just parked on the side of the road. It was parked on the side of the road, the bottom of First Street. An elderly lady, I think coming out of the library, gets in her car, and I think she had it in reverse, but thought she had it in drive. So when she starts to go, she's going backwards. She's startled and floors it and, and manages to hit my car going like 45 in reverse. An explosion of car parts and, strangely, bingo cards. I don't know. There, there are bingo cards everywhere. Like a pile of holdings and belt and bingo cards. So, um, anyhow, okay, so... It's, my car is parked on the side of the street. I'm not there. In fact, I'm actually at the um, SeaTac Airport in Seattle. So my alibi is rock solid as far as, as, far as like being complicit or any blame. It's it's um, with regard to this accident, I can say I was 100% pure innocent. I was pure victim. I did nothing to deserve that. But there's a very major difference between saying that. I was an innocent victim with regard to that moment of collision, and then saying that I, I am an innocent victim. I just, that's who I am. I'm an innocent victim through and through. Even, even with regard to that car wreck, the moment of collision, I was faultless, right? Um, purely because I was not present in any way. Now, had I been present, there would probably be problems with me. But as I spent the following nine months on the phone trying to get insurance to pay for everything, I may very well have fallen into sin on a weekly basis about that whole stupid thing. Right? I'm not innocent. I'm not an innocent person. I'm not a pure person. There, there is such a thing as a moment where fault and blame has to be assigned, and we have to say guilty, innocent. And I think it's, it's important for us to get that right, to have equal scales, to be able to say, um, with you know, with real, true, just judgment, this person is guilty, this person is innocent. And that kind of vindication is important for our courts to be able to do, it's important for our church to be able to do. We should be able to know what it, what, what it looks like to be, have somebody who is innocent, and we should be um, not ashamed or embarrassed or scared to declare their innocence. There's a big difference between being innocent with regard to a particular moment and just being innocent as a person being victim as a person. And that's where we quickly go. We go from a moment of fact to an entire narrative, to my whole character. Um, I was innocent in a car wreck, but we cannot promote innocent victimhood into a description of someone's entire character. Beware of defining yourself in terms of victimhood or in thinking of your life in terms of your victimhood. We live in an age that pushes you in that direction. This is why you have to be so on guard, because everything is inviting you to think of yourself in terms of victimhood. But it's an illusion of justification. It is an illusion of making you feel righteous. It's not the real thing. Your guilt in all the other corners of your life endure. Calling yourself a victim, living in a narrative that makes you feel just, doesn't remove any of those things. 
It's an illusion of justification. It's not the real thing. It's an illusion because it depends on you making up a false narrative about yourself, one where you are always the one being wronged and you never are the one doing the wrong. You never see your sin. Of course, that is a lie. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. While it's perfectly true that others have sinned against you, your sin against God is always far more grievous. And it is a sin that fully merits eternal death. Claiming to be the one true victim in this world is a deep lie and a distraction from your need for Jesus Christ. True justification comes when we, through faith, identify ourselves with the only true innocent lamb led to the slaughter, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We know that he is the one true spotless lamb. We know that we are often tempted to portray ourselves as the great victims. Every traffic ticket that we get is an injustice. Every call from the ref was biased against us. Every grade less than an A was prompted by prejudice. Father, deliver us, deliver us from our victimhood and imagined innocence. Deliver us through the blood of the one true innocent one, Jesus Christ. Give us rest from our vain attempts to create narratives of paper-thin innocence. And let us rest in the thick grace of your Son. And so we pray as your son taught us to pray, saying, The central message of the gospel stands in stark contrast to the central message of our age. Modern man has embraced this message of victimhood without sin, morality without standard, and science without truth. Mankind wants covenant blessings, but is horrified by the specter of covenant curses looming over covenant breakers. This is an era where we know there's great evil afoot, but our ability to actually identify evil has been so warped by the corruption of our age that we just can't spot it. So then the gospel stands forth and offers a staggering message from modern man. Your sins are great and many. You have not only broken God's law, you're incapable of even living up to your own imagined ideals for morality. You are lawless. And as the Apostle John put it, lawlessness is sin. But God is rich in mercy. God has purposed to satisfy the just requirements of his holy law and at the same time extend mercy to fallen mankind. We are lawbreakers, but God applies to our account the record of the only perfect law keeper, Jesus Christ, his son. All your sin is swallowed up in his righteousness. All of the cruelty that you've shown to others and they've shown to you might be reconciled by the tender mercies of your loving Father. All the damnable rebellions to the God who made you are cast into the sea of his promise to forget your sins. All of that is brought with force upon us in this supper of the Lord. In order for you to get off scot-free, God ordained to send his son to die in your stead. While he drank up the cup of bitter wrath, you now taste the sweet wine of grace. While Christ was broken, you are made whole. And this rich mercy is received by faith alone. And so come in faith and welcome to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our good and gracious Father, we thank you for this bread and wine these signs and seals of our union with Christ through the Spirit. Uh, we thank you that you've been rich in mercy towards us. Uh, that you've, uh, you do not count our sins against us, but through Christ you redeem us and washed us clean. We now give thanks for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the charge is this, the end to all of our strife and rivalry between what's been done to us and what we've done to each other, the, the victimhood that we might think that we uh, endured or the victimhood, the, the victims that we've made, all that strife and, and, and rivalry can only be resolved if we look to Christ, as, as the, the communion hymn says, Christ the victim, Christ the feast. So look to Christ, look to his uh, atoning sacrifice, and therefore in him you know that you have peace with God and with your brother. And now here with leaving hearts and open hands, the benediction of God our Father. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be upon and remain with you always, and amen. Amen. amen.